Hey, welcome back to the channel. Thanks for joining us again today. We got a great uh, episode for you today titled Trouble in Ecuador. It's going to be a good one, so stay tuned. We'll be right back. Hey, thanks everyone for staying with us, and uh, we hope that you will subscribe to our channel. Make sure if you think you're already subscribed that you still are, because sometimes YouTube does unsubscribe. Yep. We said that in the last video, and like three people come forward and said, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got unsubscribed somehow. You know, so uh, so glad you're back anyway. <laughs> yeah, we do try to put out videos every week. So if you're not getting something every week, you might be unsubscribed. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, we're, we put out two to three times a week. It just depends on what's happening. Mm. So a uh, little teaser earlier, we do have some trouble in Ecuador. Yep. Um, we touched on this just a little bit in the last video, but not real strong. There's um, some stuff going on with the cartels and the gangs right now. And I'm going to let Lisa tell you a little bit about that. Yeah, as you know, we've said before, one of uh, the new president, the incoming president, his name is Naboa. One of the things he ran on was trying to get the crime under control. And so he put out his plan, basically, that's um, giving law enforcement and military a little bit more ability to do their job without going to prison themselves in case somebody gets hurt on the other side. And so he put out his plan and then the cartels kind of got angry at the plan. And so uh, now there's kind of a war on crime and on gangs. Yeah, the cartels had a like a six minute video they sent that threatened the president with some kind of civil war if he did this. Yeah. And so it started. We, we've got some video we're, footage that we're going to play right here. Yeah. We warn you, some of it may seem a little violent, um, but we're going to try not to play the violent parts. So we don't want to get demonetized or anything like that or upset anybody. But uh, it's just the reality of what's going on here. Yeah. And this didn't just start. I mean, if you remember through the elections, there were um, we had some candidates that were assassinated. And so all of this has been building for a little while. Now it's just kind of come into being. And Naboa basically uh, put a 60-day state of emergency, but basically from 11 p.m. to 5 a.m. you can't travel. And that's just them trying to get things under control. Um, immediately following that state of emergency, the gang leader for Los uh, Choneros uh, escaped from prison, a maximum security prison. Um, and in that, they took guards and administration because when he escaped, then the prisons began to riot, not just the one he was in, but about six different prisons in different areas. And so Naboa then turned around and said, okay, I'm sending the military into the prisons to get things under control. I'm not quite sure where that is right now, but um, some police officers have been kidnapped and um, some administrative staff from the prisons have been kidnapped. Following that, the Los Lobos gang leader also escaped on the first night of the national emergency. Um, so they're looking for him. So this national emergency is supposed to be for 60 days. I think they're assuming they can capture them and put them back in prison and get the prisons under control in the next 60 days. There are some exceptions to the travel ban, if you will. Mm -hmm. So it's from 11 p.m. to 5 a.m. in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're traveling to the airport to catch a flight, mm -hmm. um, you can show your airline tickets that you booked a flight, um, then you're okay. Yes, uh, and I'm the, sure for certain emergencies, you're going to be fine. And a lot of it's similar to the curfews that we've had in the past. If you're traveling because you have to deliver goods or if you are um, telecommunication services or, I mean, there's lots of little exceptions to um, allow business to continue, but keep the overall traffic down on the roads. Um, but there have been explosions and kidnappings in major cities, including Cuenca. Yeah. And, you know, this is not the first time something like this has happened in this country. 
Um, even since we've lived here, there's been some some events, let me just say. Especially in the prisons. I yeah, mean, especially in the prisons. They're and, really bad. And, you know, the cartel had been here for a very long time. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not brand new, but yeah, uh, the cartel has been here. Um, we're trying to bring you all the facts that we can find, but, you know, we're a little limited in how much we actually research this kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but um, we have people that send us videos, and we reach out in the local newspapers and things. Lisa translates it. So she has a fair understanding of what's happening. Um, some some YouTubers out there don't want to give you the straight scoop on this. We have no vested interest if you want to move to Ecuador or not. We just want to help you have all the facts that we can. Um, again, these things are, they change daily. So don't hold us to anything. Well, I would say the one warning would be if you're planning a trip in the next 60 days to Ecuador, um, if you haven't made your flight tickets yet, you might reconsider and hold off a little bit until things calm down. Yeah, I, I certainly wouldn't fly into Guayaquil right now, which mm -hmm. is where a lot of this violence is happening. Mm -hmm. um, if you do have to fly into Guayaquil, stay in the airport uh, hotel and try to fly back out somewhere else. Yeah. Um, but do not travel at night when you first come into the airport. Mm -hmm. Make sure you stay in a hotel and don't leave till the next morning. Yeah. Um, do not travel at night. Yeah, that's a bad thing. Yeah. So, um, you know, our last um, video that we put out uh, was should you move to Ecuador in 2024? Um, so, uh, you know, we've had some comments on that about there is no um, corruption, extortion, et cetera, in the United States. And I have to be a little bit careful because I, I, I'm missing part of my left thumb, so I don't type real well. <laughs> and sometimes my texts, my my responses to some of your comments may seem short. And I don't mean to be short. It's just I don't type much. So um, let me just say right out loud, um, there's lots of extortion and lots of uh, corruption in the United States. And everywhere else in the world, just... Don't watch mainstream media. I mean, that's worthless. That's a propaganda network. But go out there and find some channels that you trust because they're, it's happening all over the world, and it's incredible. Sure. And we didn't leave the United States because of all those terrible things. No. We moved to Ecuador because we could afford to retire here early. You know, I was not 65 when we moved here. I was only 60. Mm -hmm. And um, so I didn't have Social Security or anything, and we had to live on our, our resources and we need to make sure that we didn't run out of money at some point. So we wanted to retire early. We've told this story before. This is a beautiful country, low cost of living. Mm -hmm. We love the climate. Love, love, love the climate. Yep. Do we like things like this state of emergency that's happening right now? No. But, you know, we're hopeful that President Naboa is going to correct those things. Yeah. But let me assure you, the United States is full of corruption and extortion. Um, for many, many years, you've been extorted by the IRS. Um, let me just say that originally was supposed to be a corporate income tax, and we got fooled into all of us paying it. And um, out of our tax money, so little of it actually goes to infrastructure and roads. All you have to do is look at the dams and bridges that are failing, and, and you can see that right now. Um, you can see what's happening with illegal immigration and where some of that money's going with that. Mm. U.S. is $34 trillion in debt. If you put the real number on it, it's probably well over 40. Yeah. Um, so huge, huge debt. You just can't keep doing that. So I well, wasn't this morning we were watching the, the riots and stuff in New York. In New York. The shutting down the city in New York. And they don't get arrested, or if they do, they get a slap on the wrist and they get let free. But if you have a political view... They put you in the gulag, and uh, yeah, and they won't let you back out with no deep process. So. I, mean, I don't care where you stand politically, but no. you got to be able to look at J six and go, wait a minute, those people <laughs> didn't have due process. No. That is wrong on all counts. Yeah, and so um, we continue to see this double standard, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so we hate that. That's that's extortion. It um, is extortion. It's a, just another flavor of it. Um, I've been extorted in so many ways. We had a business in Austin, Texas. And uh, I'll tell two quick stories there. So uh, when we bought this little building to put our business in, um, it needed some help. And there was some, some wiring up in the ceiling that go to the, some of the lights. 
that had never been taken care of. And if you touch one of those cables, you could see an arc down the other end. And so I was um, doing some work on that electrical work. Now, under the city of Austin rules and guidelines, if you are the building owner, and I was, um, you can do that kind of safety work. Um, you can even add a few lights as long as you're not adding new circuits and things. If you go to add new circuits and things, you have to pull a permit and have a licensed electrician come in, et cetera. Austin at that time had not was still not a um, a um, union shop. Let me say that. So um, I had was asking for some people to come out and set our meter or something because uh, there's something with the meter they had to do. So uh, I waited and waited and waited. Finally went to lunch. So I came back. I left the back door open for them, and they had taken my tools and left me a note that I was going to be fined and my tools were going to be confiscated forever. So, you know, ensued the argument because I wasn't going to stand still for that. And uh, little did they know, I had a li licensed electrician standing right beside me the whole time. So I uh, had to, you know, have a lawyer call them and threaten them and got my tools back after about three days. But, um, you know, that would have been an extortion. Had I paid the fine and not stood up to them um, and said, you know, yeah, you can keep $1,000 worth of tools, but I'm going to sue you to kingdom come if you do. So that's one of the ways that they, I believe, extort you. Um, that's my property. I should be able to do with it what I want to. And it doesn't justify them stealing your tools. That's exactly How long ago right. was that? Oh, that was 20 years, 25 years ago. 30, yeah. yeah, 25, 30 so, years. So, you know, yeah, they could have very easily had a telephone conversation with me and all this would have been taken care of, but they chose their bullying tactics, which is what the government in the U.S. does, all branches of it. Mm -hmm. I don't care which branch of the government you work for. Um, I have many friends who worked in government jobs who will tell you the same thing, um, and, and I just think it's bad. So the, the other story I'll tell you is that we're in that building maybe a year. We had a sign out front, and we repainted the sign because uh, it still had the old business name under it. So we just had the sign repainted. All of a sudden, here comes a guy from the Travis County Taxing Authority. He's the tax appraiser who comes in and says, uh, hey, I need to appraise everything. I said, what for? Well, you got to pay tax on everything in the building. So we had an old ratty couch we brought from our playroom at home that I had in my office. I had to pay $25 a year tax on this beat up old couch that I brought from home. And I said, look, man, that's just an old couch I brought from home. I don't care. You got to pay tax on it. And so he started going down through all of our sample books that were provided from our suppliers. I had to pay tax. Um, and, you know, in the end, I mean, I'm really upset with this guy. He's saying, you know, I never would have found you if you hadn't painted that sign. I'm driving by and noticed that it was a repainted sign. You should have just left it alone. We would have never, ever bothered you. And so um, that's an example of the county level and how they extorted us for hundreds of dollars a year. Um, it, what I think was a really bad thing. When you think about it, when that tax was purchased brand new, sales tax was paid on it, right? Um, and so if I have that tax reupholstered, that couch reupholstered, I would pay sales tax on the new, on the new fabric. So why then are we paying tax on it every year? They're claiming because it's business use. Are you kidding me? It's so, not. It's just a place to sit when you need to go into the office. Yeah. Place where we didn't want to add a bad headache and need to turn out the lights. Yeah. So it wasn't like it was making me any money. I yeah. understand if it's a piece of equipment like asphalt equipment, I'm making money with it. That's one thing. Yeah, but, but still, you, you paid tax on it. You paid taxes beyond that. It, it's just, it's ridiculous. And the really interesting thing is, is when you leave a country like the U.S. and you come to a simpler place to live, and you start calculating all the expenses that you had from where you're leaving to where you're going. And it, and it's, I mean, we were getting rid of car insurance when we got ready to leave and it's like a year's worth of living expenses. Yeah, and, and you know, we don't currently have car insurance here. Mm. Some people do, some people don't, but it's forced in the US. It's forced in many states, I think all states, as well as health insurance is forced. now. Yeah. Here, we have to have health insurance as expats coming in. Mm -hmm. So I'm not too crazy about it, but I take it because it's it's so small and, and incremental compared to what we pay in the United States. Yeah. 
I pay less than $100 a, year, a month for the insurance I have here, mm -hmm. and it covers everything. Everything's so cheap. And um, in the states that had that same kind of coverage would be you know, over $1,000 a month easy. Yeah. I mean, um, people will respond to this, leave comments saying, I pay 2000 I pay 25 So, So I hear a lot of those, mm -hmm. and I know what we were paying when we left. Um, we were fortunate. Uh, Lisa's insurance is paid by her company, and we had a Partially. good plan. Yeah. We had a good plan until Obama took over and destroyed it. Um, yeah. And then it was not, no longer really a very good plan. Yeah. It's more catastrophic, if you would. Well, then we went to the health savings plan and instead of the mainstream plans, which... Health savings plan was a much better deal. Much better deal. We still have money in that. Yeah. So um, the other thing I would say that um, if you are not aware of civil asset forfeiture, you need to be aware. People in airports, they have undercover guys who are just stopping random people. And if you have cash on you, they are stealing it. And you will not get it back. And if you think I'm lying about this, you need to watch the Institute for Justice videos on YouTube. Um, what a great organization. If you want to support an organization, that is a very valid one. They help people everywhere who are being extorted by the government. 90% of these people who have their money taken away from them without any proof they've done any crime mm -mm. whatsoever, 90% um, of those people don't get their money back because they don't know how to navigate the system. The system is set up so that you cannot fight this civil asset forfeiture. Trust me, do some research on it. If you travel with cash, any amount, it doesn't matter how much, they can take the dollar bills right out of your pocket. Now, they can not run them through a testing system that will show if that bill's ever come into contact with, say, cocaine and some other drugs. However, 90% of all the cash out there tests positive because almost all money has been come into contact with drugs of some sort. So you could be a perfectly law-abiding citizen. And I'm telling you, this happens all the time. You almost never see a situation where they actually catch a criminal, a drug trafficker um, who has this kind of cash on them, and they actually prosecute the guy. What you see are innocent civilians who are traveling to go to an auction to buy restaurant equipment, who are traveling to go to another state to purchase, you know, real estate or whatever it may be. And some of these are not large sums of cash. Some of them are. It is perfectly legal to travel within the United States with money. Now, if you're going to be traveling out of the country, there are some rules about that and, you, you know, you need to be aware of them. But I'm telling you, be very careful about how you travel with cash. You may want to think more about bank checks, cashier checks, you know, whatever you can do with those kind of things. But they are taking your money. You won't get it back. People are being stopped by highway patrol, local sheriffs, all of these different police and ent entities because they get to keep a piece of that money to themselves um, when they do confiscate your money. The rest of it goes to the FBI and gets dispersed from there. So you're being extorted. Um, I don't, you have to be living under a rock not to see that extortion goes on daily in the U.S. Police extort people for drugs and then wind up selling the drugs. You know, that happens. I'm not accusing all police officers. I am not a, you know, defund the police kind of guy by any means. Our son was a police officer. I was a reserve deputy for a short while. I can tell you I have great respect for the job, but it is becoming more and more corrupt as everything else in the world is becoming corrupt. Everything gets affected by this. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, that's my rant. Um, Ecuador is no different. It's just a much smaller scale, much more in the open and less hidden, I would say. We've yeah. never been extorted here. We've told the story of people we know who have been extorted either by police or, you know, other people. Um, we've not been. And so, knock on wood, Hopefully that doesn't happen, knock on wood. <laughs> so just want to say that, yeah, there are differences between the U.S. and Ecuador. We hope that when you make a decision to move to Ecuador, that you'll leave that there. Don't bring it here. Um, and when we say that here, we mean you have to leave pretty much all your preconceived ideas about your life and things there. Uh, everything's going to be much different here. We're going to have these situations where we have emergency orders from the president. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is a developing country. It's not a third world country. There really aren't any third world countries left in South America. Mm -hmm. Although um, the U.S. is going there quickly. Yeah.
Now, we could get to a point here where we go, you know what, we got to get out of here and we have a plan for that. And, you know, heck, we might live in Uruguay or wherever, Peru. I don't know. Uruguay is like the safest country in South America. Quite a bit more expensive than right here in Ecuador. Um, beautiful country. Um, not a lot of real pretty mountains like there are here, but that's okay. Um, there's a lot of great, nice stuff there. Good beaches, you know, fairly good climate. So Uruguay has its positives. Um, we want to continue to live here, and that's for the foreseeable future. That's what's going to happen. Yep. I'm going to die right here. <laughs> this is, Ecuador is a great place to, to live, and it's a great place to, you know, if you're going to be sick, you might as well be sick in a nice place. This is true. Yeah. There's good doctors here, good hospitals. And, um, you know, the medical system here, I would say, doesn't extort the way the U.S. system does. But there are some different things here. And, you know, one example we've mentioned before is they don't let you leave the hospital until you're paid in full. True. And they'll put a security guard in your room to, while your spouse or significant other goes and pays your bill. Well, the other thing is, is like when you leave the hospital in the States, they give you kind of everything. So if you if you want the little water jug, they don't care. You know, if you want to take this or that, they don't care because they have so much built into the cost of you staying there. Here, they don't have that built in. And so they have to make sure you pay because nobody's paying for you. Um, the money that you have goes to pay the expenses of you being in the hospital. And they don't have any other customers coming in the door that are going to pick up the slack for you. The hospital system in the U.S. is just atrocious, in my opinion. It's as corrupt as everything else. Oh, my goodness. I remember, you know, I've had some hospital bills where I was charged $1,000 for Tylenol. You know. One tablet. How can you take that much Tylenol and not die in a three-day period? Yeah. It's, no. just, it's just absolutely ridiculous. And so you don't see that kind of thing here, necessarily. No. They give you a one price. Here it is. And they tell you that price before you ever go in. So I would say um, even in the pharmacy, if you want one tablet, you pay for one tablet, yeah. literally one tablet. And so you don't have to buy the whole container. That's exactly right. And so, um, you know, I will say, too, that they, they will give you the, the complete cost before you go in. Mm -hmm. I've had to fight that in the U.S. Like I was going in for, for a procedure or a test or something, and I called a particular hospital for a week trying to get somebody to tell me how much it's going to cost, and they wouldn't. So I get there to the hospital at 5 a.m. They wanted me to report at 5 a.m. And they tell me, oh, it's going to be $6,000. And I'm like, well, wait a minute, I can get this done in Arizona for $495, and it cost me $100 to fly over there and back. So, and they're like, what? And so they sent out, of course, the manager. And so they reduced the cost to $2,500 from $5,000. But why was that? It Why was, is that? No, they said, oh, well, somebody input the data incorrectly. Yeah. But they would have taken your money and they would have never given you a discount or given you a refund for their error. And yet on your medical records, that would have stayed forever, that you had a procedure exactly right. that you didn't have. Yep. So um, once you've lived here for a couple of years, it takes, we always say it takes about two years to get the North American stink off. Oh, we were talking to somebody at the Mercado this week, and he said uh, he just, he's so anxious. He says, because he's coming from the U.S. where you just are on that hamster wheel all the time. He says he goes to take a shower and he's going, why isn't the water hot yet? <laughs> it's just like, slow down, give it a minute. I, this, this kid's here visiting. He's from Ecuador. I hope we get to interview him while he's here. I would um, hope because so. Because you're going to love this interview. This is an Ecuadorian that moved to the U.S. Mm -hmm. and is now thinking about moving back here. Yeah. And there's a lot of reasons behind that. I'll save that for that video. I, I really hope he changes his mind and wants to Me do an too. interview. So, you know, this is the thing about um, uh, Ecuador. Once you're here a while and you're, you're out of the rat race and you have some free time in your hands, you're able to do some reading and you're able to experience different things than what you've been used to and grown up with and Quite frankly, what you've been programmed to leave to believe about your country, um, you start to look at things with a new set of eyes. You do. Like right now, we're sitting under a canopy 
in the trees and it's raining. It's starting to come through. Yeah. <laughs> it's we go beautiful. to video, it'll start to rain. That's uh, it's beautiful today. <laughs> Just beautiful. We moved over here into our secret garden to do this video today because our other normal spot um, Jose is doing some work for us, building some steps over there today. Mm -hmm. We didn't want to interfere with Jose over there. He's doing good work. Yeah. And uh, he's such a great guy. So, yeah. So that's what we wanted to tell you about the, the national emergency that's going on. It just mm -hmm. got announced. Um, and again, we want to bring you the best that we can bring you in terms of, of information. But things change here quickly. And sometimes information here is sketchy at best. Um, it is sketchy at best, and you have to appreciate some of the things that go on here that don't go on in the U.S., the um, protests and how things are handled, um, and just sit back and watch because it's it's very different than where you're coming from, and it's amazing to watch. Well, we'll do a follow-up on this, and we'll tell you how this goes. And by the way, I, I did want to touch on this real quick. On the internet, somebody said to me something about, well, you still have a U.S. passport. Um, tr trying to make that a derogatory argument, I guess. But We're still U.S. citizens. You, we're still U.S. citizens. Now, I can't give up my U.S. passport till I have a passport from some other country. You need to be a citizen of another country. So I can't become a citizen of Ecuador. Um, there's some time limits and restrictions and how you... I'm just now becoming eligible to apply. I have a friend who applied here. It's taken her five years, and she's finally, and I don't know how many thousands of dollars, five years, several trips up, you know, to Azogas and different areas and interviews and stuff. And she just now has been approved for citizenship. She hasn't got it actually yet. She doesn't have a passport yet. So it's taken her five years of going back and forth. So. But does that mean she's given up her U.S. citizenship? No. Right now, you can still be a dual citizenship. Mm -hmm. The U.S. is considering ending that, that if you become a citizen of another country, you'd have to give up the U.S. citizenship. I'm not sure they're going to do that because they really like extorting you beyond the grave. So once you leave, they still expect you to pay taxes. They do, and we file in the U.S. every year. Yep. Some people here don't, but we do. Yeah. Um, so we still pay U.S. taxes, and we pay Ecuador taxes to some extent. Mm -hmm. So here's the thing. Um, if we were to give up our U.S. passports right now, Lisa has a 401k in the U.S., we'd lose close to half of that. So they hold that over our heads, basically. We can't really give up that passport without completely paying that tax on that 401k yeah. in full before we give up the passport. Right. So we're, we're kind of stuck. Now, one day I'll have a, pass, a, a passport for Ecuador. I'll be a citizen here. And then Lisa will be grandfathered, and it's a little simpler process for her. Um, you have to be over 65, or you have to take a pretty involved test. Well, but the other thing is, is we still have family in the States. We didn't, yeah. we didn't run to escape the U.S. We came to somewhere better that treated us better, that would give us a better quality of life. Um, so we didn't run away from anything. We still have family there. We still have money there. We still pay taxes there. Um, it's just not where we choose to live. Yeah, I, you know, I really hate going into the bank when we go back to the U.S. to take out some money and they want to know what I want the money for, what I'm going to use it on. Are, are you kidding me? Wait a minute. This, did I, did I enter the wrong country? Isn't this not the United States of America? What's amazing is we don't go back every year. So it's like, I haven't taken money out of here for a long time. Why are you questioning me yeah. now? It's just, it's just very interesting. The yeah. difference is there. But there are things here that we find weird as well. But, for example, after 2 o'clock in the afternoon, you can't withdraw <laughs> a bunch of money from the bank. Well, they don't prefer you to withdraw a bunch. Yeah. We've done it, but... <laughs> Only on emergency. emergencies, yeah. yeah. Yeah, they prefer you to do those things in the morning. Yeah, and that's just for them to be able to keep a balanced amount of money in the bank. So. And I would not walk around Ecuador with large sums of money on your body. No. Um, I didn't do that, that anywhere happen. in the world. Well, that's true. That's absolutely <laughs> true. Now, we did. When we first came here, walked down the sidewalk with $25,000 in our pocket to go to another bank to make a deposit. We shouldn't have done that. That was not smart. Well, you learn here, too, that they don't really write checks a whole lot. You mm -hmm. transfer the money from one bank to another once you get your bank open or 
Um, there's ways of, of getting around it. So you, you don't deal with the cash, but you don't necessarily deal with debit either. I mean, they treat a debit card just the same way as they would a credit card. Um, so if you want a discount, which they give you a good 12 to 15% discount if you pay in cash. Yeah, and so I think, um, yeah, once you get used to that transfer thing and you go yeah. online, you transfer the money. Yeah. I say Lisa does all that, so I'm used to it. <laughs> but, um, you know, it took her a little while to get the hang of it. and um, Because it's all in Spanish. Yeah, it's all in Spanish. <laughs> so, um, you know, but you, you start to learn mm -hmm. and, uh, and then it becomes very simple. Like yeah. if we want to order something out of keto today, um, we have a supplier up there we order maple syrup from. We can, um, you know, I send them a text, hey, I want maple syrup. They send me back an amount. They send me their account information for mm -hmm. their bank. And so we type that right into our online form. Mm -hmm. Boom, sends them the money. The syrup's here the next day. Yeah, so it's pretty it's good. So simple. Yep. Easy peasy. Easy peasy. All right, so that's all we know about this situation, and, <laughs> and trust then us, some. we don't we don't um, want to burn down the U.S. by any means. No, that's still our country, and but we're our eyes are very wide open about it. We're very um, we're sad at the amount of burning down of the U.S. that's happening right now. Exactly I mean, right, really and sad. some of it is, I believe, absolutely planned, yeah. and we we don't believe in that. Um, we love this country. We love our old country. We love the people in it. We don't necessarily love our governments. Um, they can tend to be unlovable at times. This is true. They need a <laughs> lot of prayer. They do. Yes, absolutely. Pray for your government. Pray for your country. Pray for some bold and stalwart leaders, if you will. Yeah. Pray for this country. Pray for this country as we're going through these um, difficult times with the uh, police force and the military trying to help and get things under control, but being um, kidnapped and extorted, so. We're still enjoying it. I'm sitting here today in my shorts and, uh, you know, just life is good for us. You're bravely sitting here in your shorts as the bugs fly around. Yeah, no decent mosquito or anything would ever bite me. <laughs> all right, thank you all for watching and we'll do a follow-up when we have more information. Ciao for now.